Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today, the best of Oklahoma gardening is populated with propagation. We travel to the Greenleaf Nursery Company in Park Hill, Oklahoma, to see how they create acres of trees through grafting. Host Casey Hinches propagates tender perennials, and we overwinter coleus through stem cuttings. here at one of our favorite places in Oklahoma and that is Greenleaf Nursery and I'm walking through a forest of Taylor junipers and you probably recognize this plant as being an upright columnar juniper but there's a lot that goes into it to get it ready to go to market. Joining us today is Paul Havener who is the production manager for Greenleaf Nursery and Paul tell us a little bit I mean normally we're not here in the winter time um, but this is a busy time for you guys as well getting these ready. Tell us a little bit about what we're looking at at this process. Okay, yeah, it, it is a very busy time for us. So we're got crews down in the propagation building that's doing our grafting process right now. So what we're gonna show you here today is we'll take a cutting off of this tree to show you what the sign wood will look like. And a lot of these trees will be sold, but some of these trees will also be shifted up into a larger containers and then sold in a later year. Okay, so we've got one that, is this a, a five gallon or 10 that, gallon? That's a 10 okay. gallon. So we're in a 10 gallon, so some of these will be shifted up to even larger. They will. Some of these are sold right now as they are? or Exactly, yeah. Okay, all right. So this didn't just happen. How did how did you get okay. it to this point? What do we need to do with okay, it? Okay, so the, the start of this process is we're gonna take a cutting here that we call sign wood. Okay. And we can take it off the terminal of the plant here and we're gonna cut it right here. And what this will do for us is it'll leave us a terminal here so it'll re-establish its apical dominance and a year from now you won't even be able to tell that we took that cutting. Okay so, so that you'll this will become your new central leader right here. It will here. Okay. and we've got the cutting here now it's the right diameter that we can match up with our understock down at the propagation building for the grafters. Okay so when we say scion that's the scion wood is the top part of a graft and it a is. lot of times we don't realize what plants are being grafted but Taylor junipers are actually grafted on a different rootstock. Exactly. Okay. They, they don't have a, a strong enough rootstock to root system to go and grow on their own, so we graft them onto a plant that has a very strong root system that will help them survive and thrive in the landscape. Okay, so now this one that you actually just trimmed off of, this is not one that you'll sell this year? Correct. Is that one you would then grow on for another year? Mm -hmm. It'll shift up into a larger container and then we'll sell it the next year. Okay, how old is this one? You that think? one, the understock for this plant is going to be a year older than the rest of the plant. Okay, all right. And you can't tell there's no other growth showing any different than the tailor that we know. Right. So. But the roots are different. All right, well, let's, shall we take that and see what we do with that? This is the next okay. step. Okay. Excellent. Okay, Casey, so we've taken our cutting out in the field, our sign wood out in the field, and now we've brought it down to the propagation building. This is our west mist room. And this is where all the grafters are. Okay. Uh, the first thing that happens, you may notice that the cutting I've taken now has been trimmed up. We have to have a, a spot at the bottom so that it can be wedged. Okay. So this gentleman is doing all of our wedges for us. He has a very sharp knife and he's taking usually one solid cut on each side to make a nice perfect wedge because what we want to do is line up the cambium layer on the cutting with the cambium layer on the understock plant so that you get a good graft union. Okay, so the diameter of the two are really important, right? The diameter of the two are, are, are important. If we have a uh, cutting that's a little bit smaller than the understock, then we want to line up one side of the cambium for sure. Okay, because that's where they fuse together and that's start. That's where they, they start forming the, the callus and they'll, they'll form the union. All right, so he's got a pile of them over there and then he's putting them in water he's after he them cuts in, them? He's putting them in water in, in the cups there and then as the grafters need them, they'll come get 
those cuttings and take them to their station. Okay. And tell us a little bit. So this is the under uh, root stock. Um, how, how old is that and where did that come from? Is it the same type of juniper or the yes. same species? Or? So we said that we started out there by taking the cutting, but actually a year ago, the understock cuttings were taken and they were stuck in a ground bed, roots grown on them. So that's actually a year older than this cutting. Okay. And they're a close cousin. Those, those are Hetzai chinensis and these are Hetzai virginianus. So they're close, so they'll form a good graft unit. Okay, okay. Excellent. So what's the next step after they've got them all wrapped up? That's the, that's just the beginning still, right? It's still, still the beginning. So once they've got them wrapped up, they will fill their tray. The trays are taken to our greenhouse where we have beds of bottom heat and mist and tinting to help keep the humidity up. All right. So I would imagine the humidity is really important and critical to make sure that they don't dry out. Mm -hmm. That Because right now that has no roots on it, so it's just living off of... It hasn't fused to the roots yet. <laughs> right. So everything this plant needs, we have to give it. It doesn't need any fertilizer right now, but it does need mist or high humidity mm -hmm. so that it doesn't dry out. Uh, when the plants are taken over there, they are plunged in under moist composted pine bark around the graft union. So that'll keep that moist. And then the mist or the tinting will keep the top moist. Okay. We're okay. giving it all the moisture it needs because it has no roots to get moisture. Okay, all right. And then the next question is how long are they on mist for, well, they're how on long mist. does it take for them to grow together? <laughs> yeah, they're on mist usually for four to five weeks. And then once we start to see a, a quarter inch of growth, new growth on the top of the sign, we know that we can back off the mist, and at that point, we will actually pull the whole plant up out of the, the moist bark, mm -hmm. and we will cut off, let me show you here, we'll actually make a cut here to remove the top part of the understock where all we have remain is the sign wood and the lower part of the understock because okay. the root system is all we really want of the understock. All right, okay. So, so once this gets planted into an eight inch container, it'll go grow two years in that container and then it starts getting shifted up into other size containers. So two years in an eight inch and then to a finished five gallon will be another year. So that would be like three years okay. at least for that one. To and in all that process, you're still harvesting some scion wood from those plants, we are. right? We're, we're har har the best sign wood you can get is off of actively growing plants. Okay. So that's where we harvest. All right. And, and where did the rootstock um, cuttings come from? And you mentioned that you had grown them out, but do you have parent plants or mother plants that you're harvesting those from as well? Yes, we have a stock block of, of okay. the understock that we'll take cuttings from that we use each year. All right, excellent. Well, this has been a, a fascinating journey, and I thank you for walking us through this. And this is just on Taylor Junipers. You guys have a lot more plants that you're producing here, and I would imagine that this is just one aspect. Uh, about how many other plants might you be grafting? Well, at least with the junipers, we also graft Canardia and Perfecta, okay. and then all of our Japanese maples are grafted. A lot of the fruit trees are also grafted. We do some sweet gums and some black gums from grafting also, but that's different departments. Okay, and, and that's probably a different type of grafting too, is that correct? Or? Yeah, uh, the junipers will get what we call a side veneer graft, but then the fruit trees and all the other trees, deciduous trees, get what we call a chip bud. It's just one bud from the parent plant grafted onto the understock. All right, well, Paul, thank you for sharing this with us. We might have to come back and check out those uh, side bud grafts as well. All right. You may remember earlier this season, we looked at how to propagate coleus through stem cuttings in order to overwinter them and bring them in. Today, we're looking at another annual and how to propagate it. This is purple sugarcane. It's a plant that we like to grow here in our children's garden each year. One, to teach children that sugar actually does come from a plant. And also we like the purple version just because it adds a little color into our garden here. Now sugarcane, as you can see, can easily reach eight feet in one season. And as it grows, it kind of becomes cumbersome to think about having to dig this plant up to overwinter. As a tropical though, it will die out each winter if we don't do something about it. Now this is a monocot, as you can tell, with the parallel veins in the leaves, and it is a cane. And so you'll notice these rings that are on 
the stems, if you will, of the plant. So this is kind of similar to uh, stem cuttings, but the one thing that we're gonna note is these rings that are on the cane. We're gonna actually harvest just one cane and take several cuttings from it. And you can see that these rings are where we're going to get the adventitious growth, both from the stem and the roots. And in fact, this is sort of doing it already here on this stem that is still attached to the main plant. You can see right here, we've got another bud that's starting to break here. And then we have some adventitious roots that are starting to develop down here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and harvest one of these canes. Rather than digging up this whole plant, we're just gonna harvest one of these canes in order to take some cuttings from it. So you can see here where we've cut our canes for propagation purposes. In warmer clients, climates where they're actually trying to harvest the cane for sugar production, a lot of times they'll take more than one cut. And you can see the shoot that's regrowing here. And this is actually known as a ratoon. So this agriculture practice where you harvest the crop and then have a second regrowth is known as ratooning. Now it depends on the climate as to how many harvests that you can get off of a crop. But the initial crop that they planted is known as the seed crop, the main crop, or the principal crop. And then the harvest that comes off of the ratoon is known as the first ratoon, the second ratoon, and so on and so forth. Now this is an agriculture practice that's often used in monocots with um, both sugarcane, bananas, and rice. And it's actually a practice that dates back to the 1700s in China, so it's been used for centuries. Once we've harvested our plant material, it's time to actually do the propagation. So we're going to go back to our canes here, um, and I'm going to show you two different methods that you can do. So again, we're looking at these growth rings that are on the cane. You can see how we've got some that are already actually creating roots here, and then there are a couple of buds that will be future shoots. So there's a, a couple of different ways of doing this. We're going to just go ahead and start by uh, taking a cutting of this. And you're going to need some pretty good loppers to cut through this cane. And then we're going to cut down below. We want to at least get two of those rings in this. So one method of doing this is to actually take the whole cutting and put one ring below the ground and one ring above the ground um, or the potting soil that you're using. So the ring that's below the ground is going to have adventitious roots that develop off of it, and that's going to become your new root system. The ring that is above the ground will start to produce more shoots and leaves, or also what is called ratoons, where those shoots develop from the stem growth. And so this will be a new plant for us next spring. Now again, the bigger the plant uh, container you put it in, or the more cuttings you put in here, the larger plant you will have to put out next spring. Another method of propagating these canes um, through cane cuttings is to go ahead and take a cutting that just has one ring on it. And for this particular one, we're going to go ahead and just actually place it halfway in the soil on its side. Now, if you know about the xylem and the phloem system, that might seem a little... Uh, against what we know as far as the fluids moving through the plant. But what's gonna happen here is, the, again, the adventitious roots are gonna develop on the bottom half of this ring, and the vegetative growth is going to develop on the top half of this ring. And we have an example of this here, as we've got some that have already started growing. So you can see how much um, the roots have started to develop and are growing down. And in fact, they're already growing out of our little container here. And then we've got some ratoons or shoots that are developing off of this cane. 
So obviously they're not going to um, grow all winter long in this container. Um, this is just a container to kind of get them established. And then once, we'll, once they're established, we will pull this out and replant it into a larger container. So the next form of asexual propagation is division. And this is probably one of the most popular forms of propagation for many homeowners with their perennials um, because it's simply going in and dividing your plant up. So in this case, we're doing it because we want to overwinter the smaller portion of our plant. And so we're just going to take some of these pups that we've harvested off of the mother plant um, and pop them up. Now again, you want to make sure that you put it in the size of a container that can handle it as it continues to grow throughout those winter months. Um, but you can see here, we've got one here that's already taken off and really starting to fill up that pot as this one will continue to do. The nice thing about calicaceous is they really appreciate a lot of water. So you can actually um, get a container that doesn't have holes in it um, and set this container inside of it and just fill it up with an inch or two of water, sort of creating a, a bog container garden inside your house. And so it really works well as a house plant. You don't, you don't have to worry about overwatering it too much. So whether you're doing stem cuttings, cane cuttings, or division, these are all great methods of propagation to get your garden started next spring. Now, this spring we talked about how easy it is to propagate uh, coleus just simply by cutting them off and putting them in water. And you can see here that we actually did this last week and how quickly those roots will develop. You'll notice that the roots are starting to develop at the nodes where there used to be leaves attached. So you can see right there and there. Now you'll just put this in a, a water container and put it in some sun so they'll continue to photosynthesize and those roots will develop. Now what this is, is this is called a stem cutting. But I want to back up a minute and let's just talk about propagation in general. What we're doing when we're propagating something asexually is different than planting a seed. So that's when the plant gets fertilized by the pollen and then it develops into a seed, which often that's how we grow many plants. But there are several reasons why we might asexually propagate plants, and that can be done through stem cuttings. It also can be done through budding and grafting. Division is a popular way of dividing a lot of our clumping ornamental grasses and other perennials. And I know many home gardeners use division as a way to share their plants or to rejuvenate their plants in their garden. And that is also an asexual form of propagation. Now you might do this sort of propagation for many reasons. One, it's sometimes a faster way to get a bigger plant quicker. Um, it also might be you want particular characteristics and you want to maintain those characteristics. If you actually take a cutting from a plant, then you're going to maintain those same genetics in that next plant. You are literally taking a clone of that plant, whether it's through division or through stem cutting or root cutting. There's a lot of different ways of asexually propagating plants um, and division as being one of those or stem cutting. You might remember we went to Greenleaf earlier this spring and they were doing some budding of uh, Taylor junipers. And again, that was a method of keeping those Taylor junipers, which have a characteristic of being very tall and columnar and maintaining that characteristic. So while coleus are easy to propagate and you can just put them in water, um, there are other ways to propagate plants that might be a little bit more difficult. The one thing you want to make sure you get first is some rooting hormone. Rooting hormone is a white powder um, that you can easily purchase at a uh, box store or a local nursery. It's often available, especially during the gardening season. Um, but you'll notice that on it, it says IBA. Um, and this is basically a synthetic hormone and it's in a very low concentration. What you'll most often find is that it's in a concentration of a tenth of a percent. Um, and it does come in higher uh, ratios or higher percentage of that active ingredient, um, which is IBA. This is a synthetic version of a naturally occurring hormone, auxin, which is often in plants that causes them to root. Um, but then it goes on up to other percentages. Here we have the tenth of a percent. Uh, we have three tenths of a percent, eight tenths of a percent. Um, this one actually is 1.6 
percent. And then finally, this is our most extreme one that we have here, and this is 3% IBA. So the reason why it comes in different percentages is based off of what you're going to propagate. And so you'll need to do research on that. Some things are more difficult and therefore they need more of that hormone in order to initiate that rooting. If we're doing coleus, which is simple to propagate, as easy as putting it in water, you're just really going to need that one tenth of a percent that you might find at any store. If you're wanting to propagate something like clematis, which can be a little bit more difficult, then you're going to need the three tenths of a percent. And if you're wanting to propagate something that's like boxwood, which is woody and might be a little more difficult, then you're going to need that eight tenth of a percentage in order to propagate those plants. Now when you're starting propagation, you always want to keep in mind sanitation as well. And so if you can, make sure to look for the healthiest tissue on the plant that you're wanting to propagate. When you take a cutting, it's ideal if you can take it from the top of the plant. Usually there's more airflow, which means less disease potential and insects, and also there's less splashing from the soil. So that it tends to be healthier tissue towards the top of the plant. However, that's not always the case. You always want to make sure that you are trying to get the healthiest tissue to propagate so that you don't bring anything into a situation that you don't have to. Um, and so when you're doing that, you're going to want to make sure that you're cutting at least two nodes. The nodes are the point at which the leaves are connected to the stem. The stem that's between the nodes is called the internode. And so really you can clip anywhere uh, in that internode below two nodes. I like to clip just above the third node so that it leaves a clean cut on the plant. Otherwise, this stem would still be on that plant and it would just be hanging out there and create an open wound and potential for more problems on that plant left in the garden. Now at this point that I have it back to where I'm going to propagate, what I'm going to do at this point is go ahead and trim the rest of that off and cut a, a new cut just below that second node there. Now I'm also going to remove the stems. Sometimes you can do this with your fingernails, but it's really best to go ahead and use some snips so that you've got a nice clean cut and you don't worry about tearing that stem. If you wanted to, let's actually, this is a little bit longer than what I expected. I'm going to go ahead and trim this up even more so and cut it right there. So we've got some leaf still above. We could even go further if we wanted to, but this is enough. And we've got one uh, node that we're going to dip in our rooting hormone and then plant in the soil. Now, when you're putting uh, rooting hormone on your plant, you don't just want to go in the container like this. Because if there was something wrong with this, you're contaminating all of your rooting hormone. So you really want to just tap out a little bit Basically, just the amount that you're planning on using during that session of propagation. Take your cutting. Make sure it coats that node because that's where a lot of that root development's going to happen. And then we'll place it in our soil. Now, if I was just to push this down in there, a lot of that powder might come off. So using either your finger or a pencil, just make a small hole and then you can press the soil back around that cutting. You want to maybe go ahead and remove some of these lower leaves if they still seem pretty big. You just need a couple of leaves. In fact, you could even take these off if you wanted to, and having those two will allow it to get a new uh, growth going as the roots are developing below ground. Now, in order for that to happen, though, we've got to keep this in a humid, um, moist environment. We don't want to keep it soggy wet because that will cause it to rot, but we do need to keep it moist. So a lot of times you might do this in one of those containers that we've talked about, the clamshell containers, creating sort of a terrarium effect, or you would put it on a mist bench in order to keep that moisture level high. So again, while this might seem like a little bit of overkill on a plant that can actually root in water, this is the practice that you would use for stem cutting. And it might seem like it might take a little while, but the more you get uh, used to what you're doing, you're going to be an old pro at this and be snipping these off in no time and be plugging them into your, uh, your potting soil. And you'll have a flat of these in no time at all. 
you just want to make sure that you're researching what plant you're doing because this might not be the proper uh, rooting hormone or it might not be the proper way to root whatever particular plant that you're looking at propagating. So that's the important thing. For more information on propagating plants, check out this extension publication. Next week, we are all about Bermuda grass, or more specifically, eradicating it from our ornamental and food gardens. Casey will go through the highlights of our Bermuda grass eradication study and some of the successful and not as successful products and methods that we tested. And then we'll visit a food pantry garden where they're using purely mechanical practices to keep the Bermuda grass in check. Until then, we wish you health and wellness, and we'll see you next week for more Oklahoma Gardening. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club.